My name is Dirk. I'm a solutions architect in AWS from Germany. And I'm really glad that you came tonight. I know it's super late. I cannot even say anymore I'm between you and the beer because typically folks would be already deep in the beer at this point in time. And shout out to everybody who brought their beer. Great. So let's have a bit of fun um, tonight. Unfortunately, I have to wait with my beer uh, for a few minutes. I would like to talk with you a little bit about trade-offs, divide and conquer, loose coupling, patterns, and asynchronous messaging. So let's have a look at the agenda. So first of all, um, I want to provide a little bit of a motivation why we should be talking about asynchronous communications and asynchronous messaging in the first place. And uh, I have recently added um, a few minutes to that because I got feedback from customers that it would be quite helpful to have a more broad uh, motivation and introduction. Then I'm going to share with you a few fundamental integration patterns that are mostly based on asynchronous messaging. And to make it all more tangible and put some flesh to the bone, I also brought a few uh, use cases, uh, example architectures um, that I'm going to discuss with you. And in the end, I have a few resources and a call to action to take away. A few related sessions. Unfortunately, most of this is already gone, if not even all. But I also wanted to share with you um, what we did in API 202, Decoupled Microservices. This is actually a hands-on workshop where we have labs that implement the example use cases that I also have uh, tonight. And you can also ask your uh, friendly AWS uh, solutions architect that uh, looks after you um, to run these labs with you as an immersion day about uh, asynchronous messaging. And API 312, uh, that was a chalk talk this afternoon that I ran with um, my colleague Christian Müller, um, where we also uh, discuss a decision tree, how to select the best integration service for your particular scenario. And that's also something that you can ask your solutions architect about. All right, a little bit of motivation though. Why are we talking about integration in the first place? Well, it's a simple answer because everybody is concerned with that. You know, every company deals with integration scenario and that appears on any area and, and, and any layer. And a fairly prominent example is this this is obviously a monolith. And uh, when companies build a monolith over years or maybe decades or so, there is oftentimes eventually the situation that it becomes more and more difficult and painful to deploy a new version and also to maintain everything. Everything breaks during our deployment and so on. And this is usually um, the result of a um, lack of um, cleanliness in, in the code. So people start referencing variables from other components that manifest itself in spaghetti code. And that adds coupling to the components of your monolith, which means if you want to change something in one component, you might have to change something in a different component too, or even more of them. And then eventually, um, also, um, you can oftentimes observe a, a state that there's also um, only little cohesion left in the particular components. So that uh, fundamental function, functionality is sometimes spread over multiple components. And all this um, drives many customers and companies to think about uh, an architecture refactoring and to switch to the microservices architectural style or maybe to self-contained systems. And that brings a new integration um, challenge with, with it. Um, the typical first step is that you start carving out one um, sample service in a, as an experiment. That is typically one um, that brings you a lot of pain currently or that is uh, seen as an easy exercise to begin with. But in any case, you eventually um, end up in, in a such a scenario that you have a lot of systems that now need to be integrated and they have to interact with each other. 
And I have started with talking about microservices, and that's also uh, the general topic of this talk. But this is all not restricted to microservices. It could, this could also be just any kind of applications that need to interact with each other. And uh, some of your applications uh, or systems um, might have um, more closer interaction. Um, so then in this uh, example, they are closer together. Others are maybe f more far away, like uh, external systems or, or SaaS solutions. In any case, be it microservices or applications or other systems that you need to integrate, you always have something to integrate. And that's why I like this um, quote of my colleague Gregor Hoppe. In modern cloud applications, integration isn't an afterthought. It's an integral part of the application architecture and the software delivery lifecycle. So when we talk about integration, what options do we have in the first place? Here we see a list of uh, common integration approaches, and all of them um, have their use, and all of them make sense when, they use, when you use it in the right scenario and with the right use cases. If you use it um, in the wrong scenario, it can add a lot of pain to your overall experience. Since uh, we cannot discuss all of them today, and since I also said in the beginning, I want to focus on asynchronous messaging, uh, that's the three options that we're going to touch today, where uh, the focus is, as I said, on messaging. And to explain more why we actually want to do this and want to consider asynchronous communications with messaging, um, I want to um, wrap this in a kind of um, small guidance, which I have called the Lifehacker's Guide to Software Architecture. And the first guidance that is always true, that is really always true, is number one, beware of the face healer. <laughs> what does it mean in the first place? Who is the face healer here? It can be a person, it can be a tool, it can be a methodology that tells you, just use me and all your pain is gone and everything is solved. Um, the ugly truth, though, is in software architecture, there's no silver bullet to solve everything, which applies probably to every area in life. And that's why you have to be clear that um, there is no architecture decision without a trade-off. Whatever you do, in the end, every architecture decision sucks in a certain way. You just need to find the least painful option from the ones that is on the table and convey this also to your teams. The second um, guidance here is divide and conquer. And taking the first one into account, I'm not saying that divide and conquer solves everything. But according to my experience, it makes a lot of things easier, but you have to pay for it. So coming back to the original example, uh, the monolith, and then um, the landscape of systems, it might bring you to something like this. Um, probably for most of you not, right? So this is a dependency graph from Amazon.com from 2008. I don't want to know how it looks today. But not everybody is Amazon.com, right? So realistically, what you would experience um, in, in your company is rather something like, like this graph, right? And, a manageable amount of systems that you have to integrate with each other. I have stolen this from, from Adrian Cockcroft's uh, GitHub um, account, and it looks actually, it is, is, it is uh, nicely suitable to show um, how the systems are connected together. Like you can imagine from the left-hand side, a request comes in to your overall system, and then uh, typically um, other systems need to be called to fulfill the overall response. And, and staying with the um, Amazon.com example from an uh, online shop website, when you have the details of an article in your browser tab, then there, there's a number of services that is called under the hood that um, grab the current price of the item, uh, how many items are in stock, uh, how fast can it be delivered, and so on. So this is all needed to create the overall result. If you have so many systems that you need to orchestrate and, and integrate and, and manage, 
Also, according to my experience, it makes it a lot simpler when you integrate them in a very loosely coupled manner. And to understand this better, let's dive a little bit into the difference of synchronous and asynchronous communication. So synchronous communication, um, and taking, uh, coming back to the example um, of the monolith broken down into separate systems, you typically have um, HTTP APIs that you uh, use, um, hopefully even REST APIs or so, that uh, are used to um, now exchange data between what used to be the components of your monolith. Unfortunately, even if you use a REST API, which um, allows for loosely coupled um, integration to a certain extent, companies often don't see that many of the problems are solved. And there are a few reasons behind that. One of the reasons is that REST APIs, if you use them, um, are actually REST uh, less and not REST full most of the time. Like 90 something percent of the APIs out there are actually not REST full because they are lacking a very important aspect, which is uh, hypermedia. Um, as long as the server doesn't tell the client uh, through the means of link relations and links what to do next and how to access um, subsequent resources, you bind already the, the code of your client to a concrete implementation of your API, which makes it quite inflexible. But there's uh, also more to it. If we have a synchronous request response pattern that we see here, the requester sends a request, the responder works on it, it takes a bit of time, and then the response is sent back through the HTTP connection. While that request runs, you bind resources on both ends. And coming back to our landscape of systems, when the request from the outside comes in, this is only a simple example path here, but you see already that several systems are involved, and you bind resources on all those systems while your overall request is being processed. And this is why the next step would be to exchange your um, synchronous API with an asynchronous API. So with that, you can reduce the time that you bind resources on both ends um, quite a bit. So the requester sends only the request to the responder and gets an acknowledgement. Now the responder can work on it, and afterwards the responder can uh, send it back. That's already great, but still, um, there are dependencies left. And we're going to look at that now when we have um, a differentiation between APIs and messaging. So again, the asynchronous request response uh, pattern implemented by APIs, it still has some dependencies. The first one is the location dependency. So the requester actually has to know all the addresses of the responders. And it can not only be one, it can be also multiple if you have a fan out scenario. And the other dependency is the availability dependency. Because you can hardly send out an HTTP request when the other end is down. And this is exactly addressed by messaging. Because messaging adds an additional component between both ends. And now the requester only sends um, the request to a message channel. We will understand in a bit what that is. And it doesn't even have to know about the responder and vice versa. So the requester sends a message to the message channel. The responder uh, receives it from there, works on it, and it sends it back to another message channel from where the requester receives it again. Now, apparently, um, you offload um, the location dependency now to your messaging system. But that's a, a different game now, because A, um, you can have a team that does this as a day job um, to make sure that um, the messaging system is available. And even better, if you use a cloud-native serverless messaging system, then um, you have a lot of availability and scalability. And also, you can now talk about, or the requester can now uh, configure business logic and not technical details anymore into how to address the uh, system to send the re request to because you can have typed message channels that have a meaning. And all this 
brings me to this quote, friends, that lo friends don't let friends rely on synchronous integration. And now the last um, item in my short list of the Lifehacker's Guide to Software Architecture is patterns, which I'm gonna use to now more talk about how messaging systems work and what patterns they implement. Patterns are a great tool, actually, for software architects to discuss things because they provide a lingua franca. So you can uh, discuss complex scenarios and it's always obvious what the other person means when you talk in patterns. If you are a software developer, you probably know the Gang of Four design patterns catalog. Who knows it? Who uses it? Can I see some hands? Yeah, that's quite a few. Great. And when it comes to integration, there's also a standard catalog which is called Enterprise Integration Patterns, which was published in a book of the same name, even something like 20 years ago, but it's still super relevant today. That QR code brings you to uh, the website for the book um, where you can, can get a good summary and overview of all the patterns. And I would now like to dive a little bit into it and, and share uh, some fundamental patterns with you. Now we have again uh, the one-way and asynchronous request response um, communication that we saw before, but now with a few more details regarding messaging. So again, we see the message channel decouples both sides from each other. They don't have to know anything about each other anymore. Um, something that is also quite interesting um, to mention is the message intent. Um, typically, we have command, document, and event messages. Command uh, messages would typically lead to a request response scenario. Event messages or events um, are quite a buzzword these days, but in the end, they are only messages, right? It's only that the intent, intent is and the content is something has happened, but in the end, they are still messages. Now, maybe a few questions came up uh, to you already before when we looked at the asynchronous request uh, response case, because since we have now um, the request part and the response part decoupled, um, the responder needs to know where to send the response, right? Um, it's not an HTTP connection anymore. And also, the requester needs to know when a response comes in from that response channel, what was actually the request that I used for that? And two patterns address these questions. The first one is return address, which is a piece of meta information that you can add to the request message and that instructs the, the responder uh, where to send the response. And the second question is addressed by the correlation ID pattern, which is a um, unique ID that you add to your uh, message, to your request message, and the responder then forwards it back to the requester in the response message. And then uh, the requester can use it to assign that response with the previous request. Since we have mentioned message channels now several times already, what kinds of message channels do we have? So the first one is point-to-point, -point, which is typically implemented by queues. And the second one is publish-subscribe, also known as fan-out, and typically implemented by topics. Let's have a little, a little look at the characteristics of those. As you can see on the left-hand side for the queues, every message that goes into the queue is sent to one of the available receivers. So it implements a competing consumer's pattern. Multiple receivers can um, compete on all the messages that are available. And that also means if you have high load in your queue, you can scale out on the consumer side by just adding more compute there, more processes, and so on, which is uh, very helpful. Also, queues buffer messages. And with that, um, you can flatten peak loads. You can just use a queue to flatten peak loads um, so that you can um, process the messages at your individual pace. Taking both into account, you could also consider a queue as a buffering load balancer. Topics, on the other hand, uh, have a different characteristic. They deliver each message to all of the parties on the right-hand side, which are now called subscribers, because we are in the publish-subscribe pattern. 
So when it comes to um, big traffic on the topic and you consider and you, you notice that each of your sub subscribers um, cannot cope with the message load uh, anymore, you cannot just add an additional um, process to get uh, done with the load because that additional process would also receive every message. So we need to um, park this for a second, um, but we will answer it. And um, the other characteristic of a topic is that it typically doesn't buffer messages. So we also need to think about what can we do to make sure if we are in planned or unplanned downtime that we don't lose messages. Both is addressed by a composite pattern, which we call the topic queue chaining pattern. So with that, you um, don't directly uh, attach your consumers to the topic, but you put a queue in between. And with that, you get the best of both worlds. So you implement your durable subscriber pattern. So you will not miss any messages anymore when um, you go and plan to unplanned maintenance. And you again have the um, concurrent consumer pattern. So you can scale out on the receiver side. There's another flavor of a um, published subscribe messaging uh, channel, which is a message bus. The difference uh, between topics um, is a bit ambiguous, particularly um, when you look at concrete products. And that's one of uh, the main problems that we hear from customers um, when it comes to integration in the first place. There's a lot of ambiguity involved um, you can reach your goals with what you want to build with many different options and it's sometimes not uh, clear what is actually the best option. And therefore you need to really well understand what your functional and non-functional requirements are. And if you talk in patterns, it makes it easier also to decide on the concrete architecture that you want to go with. So a message bus is typically used in a broader scope than a topic. A topic is typically used in a uh, use case, micro use case uh, scope. Um, two parties uh, or two groups of parties are involved here. While a message bus is um, rather used in an application context, so where a lot of systems uh, exchange data with each other. But that's only, I'm saying typical. It's, uh, it's not a rule. You always have to decide what works best for you. Another difference is that um, the parties involved typically don't only produce or consume messages, but do both. And you have additional functionality, like uh, typically all message buses implement something like a content-based router. Um, you might have payload constraints, like it has to be a JSON uh, payload. And you also have uh, third-party adapters. Now, let's have a look at what AWS services implement those um, patterns. So for point-to-point -point or queue, there's the Cloud Native and Serverless uh, service, Amazon Simple Queue Service or Amazon SQS. And for the topics, we have Amazon Simple Notification Service or Amazon SNS. And in my example architectures, I only use the serverless services and that is also my personal approach to go serverless first because it's the simplest one and only if that doesn't work, I would go with non-serverless options. However, you might be in a uh, migration scenario or you are bound to industry standard protocols like um, JMS or MQP. Then you can use um, also uh, Amazon MQ, which is a managed rabbit MQ or active MQ service. And there's also um, a message broker in AWS IoT Core actually. Um, which uh, provides MQTT, MQTT over WebSockets and HTTPS to publish uh, messages for apps. It is in the IoT context, it's a service in the IoT context, but it's also really a nice service to send push notifications to mobile devices. And um, in terms of message bus, there's Amazon Event Bridge, um, which implements also the message bus functionality in a cloud native and serverless manner. Since I said already, there's a lot of ambiguity involved here. Let's add a little bit more to it. <laughs> Messaging versus streaming. That's an endless discussion. There's also a lot of religion involved. 
There's also sometimes a certain face healer involved, which you could name Kafka, for instance. But um, I just wanted to point out what uh, is the original intention of messaging versus streaming. So here on this picture, you see myself and my colleague Christian uh, on top of Moss Isley Spaceport. And if we consider this picture, it has a meaning for our application, then I would use messaging for this. Because for messaging, every each, each, even, sorry, each individual message uh, is a unit in, of work and has a meaning for your application. Also, in terms of consumption, every message is gone once you have uh, consumed it. And what that means to consume a message, we will also see in a bit. The original idea of streaming is rather to work on batches of messages. And if we now take this picture and cut it down into uh, 1,000 tiles, for instance, then that batch of tiles would be of interest for my application. I, ha I have to look at all those tiles to understand uh, the big picture. Also, um, the consumption model is different with streaming because messages are retained in streams when you consume them and uh, at least until they uh, expire. Um, the typical original use case, at least for messaging, is that you want to in, uh, investigate over a batch of messages to find anomalies, to do aggregations, and stuff like that. For the sake of completeness, um, the AWS services that implement uh, the stream pattern, it's the Amazon Kinesis family, and uh, the Amazon Managed Streaming for Apache Kafka service in the respective variations. Let's come back to message channels, though. Um, a few very um, useful patterns um, I have here also, um, and the first one is the dead letter queue. So imagine you send out a message to a queue, and um, there's always uh, an exception when you process one of those messages. You don't want to have that in an endless cycle, right? And, and therefore, um, you want to have a mechanism that helps you here. Um, such a message that always runs into an exception is called the poison pill. It doesn't necessarily have to be something malicious. It's just, um, the meaning is that it just uh, cannot be processed successfully. Now, if you configure your messaging system in a way that after so and so many failures, this message is moved to somewhere else, then this would be the dead letter queue where you can investigate without the hassle of production what is actually going wrong here. In order to understand um, one other pattern afterwards, I also want to quickly introduce these three terms, visibility timeout, in-flight messages, and message acknowledgement. With two cases, the first one is fast enough consumer. You will instantly see what I mean with that. So let's assume that um, there is a queue and we have um, a time axis. Um, in the beginning, there's a producer that creates message A and sends it into the queue. And we use Amazon SQS, simple queue service, as an example for this. So once I have sent my message into the queue, the message status is stored. Then there's a consumer who asks for messages from the queue. The message is delivered to that consumer, and from that moment on, the message status is in flight. And also a visibility timeout starts. As long as this visibility timeout is running, the message is invisible to other consumers. So we have consumer C2 in this case, it will not see this message. Consumer C1 is done with processing the message and then it, it acknowledges the message. And that means in concrete terms that the message is deleted from the queue. That's actually the name of the operation for SQS also. And then the message status is deleted and certainly this status will not change anymore. Let's have a look at the other uh, case, the not fast enough consumer. I guess you can already uh, know what that means. The starting situation is the same as before. Now we reach the end of the visibility timeout and consumer C1 is not yet done with message processing and has not acknowledged it. From that moment on, the message status is stored again and it becomes visible to other consumers. So in this case, consumer C2 can get the message. And again, the visibility timeout starts 
hopefully this time with more success. So that's also then um, the guidance that you should um, set your visibility time out according to the expected processing time. But why have we talked about this? Um, because I wanted to make sure that the term in-flight message is understood when we talk about FIFO queues. First in, first out. Um, the requirement is mentioned relatively often and sometimes it's even, even reasonable that messages come out of uh, the queue in the same order as they went in. Apparently, this comes at a cost because if you run at high scale, it becomes more and more difficult um, to keep the sequential order of things, whatever that is. And that has nothing to do with bad technology or bad software. It's, it's rather uh, physics. So you have to um, reduce the scope and the concurrency to a certain extent that you can really guarantee a strict order. And simply uh, thinking about FIFO queues that just make sure that every message is dequeued in um, the order as it came in is not enough here. That is too naive. You need an additional pattern that helps you here, which is the message groups pattern. And I want to walk you through how Amazon SQS implements this pattern with the help of message group IDs. So let's, um, let's assume we have two concurrent consumers here. And by the way, this is only relevant if you have more than one consumer apparently, right? Otherwise you don't have parallelism in the consumer side. And the different colors of the messages mean that they belong um, to a different message group. Um, the message group ID is a discriminator attribute that you add as meta information to your message. And let's see what uh, happens when we use this now in a FIFO queue. So message A is sent to one consumer. All great, it's being processed. Message B is sent to the other consumer, processing runs. And wow, uh, message B was already done with processing while message A is still running. So what would you now want to have delivered as the next message? Message C or message D? Who is for mes message C? Can I see some hands? No hands, great. Who is for message D? Awesome. So um, what actually happens is that message D is now delivered, although it is not the very next one. But um, to make sure um, that we have a certain, retain a certain order, now no message is delivered to a client from a message group where another message is currently in flight. So uh, the blue message is now delivered and being processed. Then message A is done. And now we can continue with message C. So what we have then in the end as a result, um, the message order on the consumer side is not the exact order how messages came in, but we retained order within each message group. And this is a tool that you then can apply to still um, add some uh, scale out um, opportunities. So you would scale out uh, based on the number of message group IDs. And we call that a, a local message order. Um, a global message order, however, if you want to have that, um, you would have to use one message group, right? And that uh, then typically degenerates into a rather sequential processing. There are also five for topics. The good thing is we don't have concurrent consumers, so we don't need to care too much. But what if we want to uh, chain a topic and a queue? So at least um, in the case of uh, Amazon SNS and Amazon SQS, those message group IDs are moved over and um, you can also then uh, retain um, the message order on uh, message group IDs in the same way for uh, topics and queues. I have a few message routing patterns left um, before we dive into the example architectures. So the first one is message filter. Um, we said before that uh, for topics in the PubSub um, scenario, every subscriber receives every message. But in reality, Sometimes there are subscribers who are interested only in a subset of the message, messages. In this case, um, 
one is only interested in red and one is only interested in blue messages. So we could, of course, set up um, um, dedicated topics for each of those cases, but maybe um, the number of the variations can become quite high. So it's much easier to apply the message filter pattern. And this is something that each subscriber can individually uh, configure with the messaging system on the topic. The publisher, as usual, doesn't know anything about it and is not interested in it. And I have mentioned this particularly because I wanted to show um, how much simpler this is when uh, you use messaging compared to when you don't use messaging. Because when you want to read uh, the very same thing, you could use the recipient list pattern uh, in a non-messaging scenario, where now on the publisher side, or at least in an intermediate component, you would have to decide um, where to send each message. So somebody has to know who is actually interested in each message and how to address all those subscribers. That is additional code, additional configuration that you need to run, operate, maintain, and so on, um, which you don't want to do if there's no need for it. So messaging is a lot easier. Another very helpful um, pattern, it's, uh, it's a composite pattern of actually many other um, fundamental patterns. It's the scattergather pattern. And you use it in, um, in scenarios where you want to have some parallel processing and you're looking for the best or an aggregation um, of the responses. So we have a requester um, context where you send out um, a request into a topic and then there are a number of potential responders who can work on the request and submit their individual response into a response queue. And from there, it goes back into the context of the requester, who can then aggregate uh, the responses and do some final processing. And this is, if you ask me, uh, the beauty of patterns, because if you now know the scattergather pattern and somebody talks about it, you already know, okay, this is the architecture for this pattern. And we see many of the other patterns that we already mentioned before in here. We have, um, we have a conversation pattern here because it describes the conversation re between requester and responders. Apparently, we will use the correlation ID pattern and the um, return address pattern and so on. To almost reach the finish line with patterns, um, the two last patterns um, on the message routing um, cat category are pipes and filters and one that I will mention afterwards. So we can imagine that um, we have a work item that requires a lot of processing steps to eventually reach um, the final state. And the pipes and filter pattern is one approach for this. It doesn't actually have to be uh, linear, but it's easier to uh, describe it now in this picture. Um, each processing step is called a filter here, and uh, they are connected by pipes, which you can uh, um, implement uh, with messaging, of course. Um, the thing that um, you might see here is that every uh, processing step, every filter needs to have some knowledge about what happens next. By the way, um, an AWS service that makes it really easy to implement that is Amazon EventBridge, um, the message bus service. Now, if you don't want to have that dependency between each filter and the next step, you can go with the Saga orchestration pattern. And the Saga orchestration pattern solves this by externalizing all that knowledge about what's next, um, maybe how do we branch um, in our processing. It externalizes this into an orchestrator component. And only the orchestrator component knows what to do next. And now uh, the code in each of those processing steps, um, it can just be dumb and uh, do one tiny thing really well, but it doesn't have to know anything about what happened before and what happened next. And an AWS services that implements this pattern is AWS Step Functions, which is a cloud native and serverless service that makes use of uh, state machines to implement such workflows. All right, so that was a number of patterns and now to make it more tangible even, I have some uh, sample use cases. 
And I first want to introduce uh, the context of those use cases, which is a uh, fictional but very favorite technology startup called Wild Rides. And Wild Rides disrupt customer uh, transportation by replacing old guard taxi cabs with unicorns because it's much more fun to run on a unicorn than with a, a traditional taxi cab and it's of course much more magical. Um, they have a modern uh, software architecture under the hood. It's all serverless, they run microservices and um, they were so nice to share a few of their uh, use cases with us. The first one is submit write completion. And the context here is that the unicorn has just dropped off a passenger somewhere and it now wants to tell Wild Rides about it so that Wild Rides can collect some money uh, for it and so on. So it uses the Wild Rides Unicorn app and the app would send a HTTP request to the backend. So um, let's imagine there's a ride management service uh, on the server side and typically you would have something like an API gateway um, that um, takes a request and uh, routes it to a um, piece of code that we now call the completed rights processor. You would also want to persist it in a database and then you can return to the client, okay, we have created your resource, this is how it looks like and so on. All good. Now you can probably imagine that uh, there are more services in the landscape of wild rights and those other services are probably also interested to learn about this like the customer not notification service or the customer accounting service. And then there's the extraordinary rights service, which is a special service that is only interested in rights that have a fair and distance over specific thresholds. Now, the question is how can we integrate all this? One approach would be, we see there's a database in the right management service we could just connect all these uh, services on the right hand side to the database and we are done, right? So the question, integration via database. Who thinks that is a great idea? Can I see a few hands? That's very nice. Um, yes, uh, I don't think it is a great idea. Um, you shouldn't do this. Um, the thing is that um, integration via database uh, couples the other services so much to that spe specific database that it, will, that it will almost very sure break your integration eventually. So you wouldn't want to do that. However, the traffic lights here, uh, the red light has the shape of uh, a heart. Uh, if you explain this to your teams, you should do it with empathy, of course. I found that traffic light in uh, the beautiful country of Iceland. Is someone here from Iceland? No? No, that was only a beer that was not uh, raising hand, okay. Um, second option, integration uh, via REST APIs maybe. Um, if you remember what we heard in the introduction, what do you think? Is it a viable option? Well, it is a viable option but also it comes with a cost. So um, we would fall back to the recipient list pattern and we would have to have some code and configuration that knows where to send all those HTTP requests. You could embed this uh, either in the completed write processor or use a separate component. But then there's also uh, that filter for the extraordinary write service. You would have to implement this also on your own. Next try, integration via messaging. Who thinks that, is, uh, that this is a good idea? And who is raising their hand because the slide says absolutely? <laughs> okay, thanks for being honest. Yeah, but it's really um, a very good approach actually. If we use Amazon SNS here, all, of, uh, all the services on the right hand side can um, autonomously um, subscribe to this topic and receive all the messages. The extraordinary rights service can also use the SNS message filter functionality to um, only receive the messages that it is interested in. And by the way, 
Uh, since about one week ago, um, Amazon SNS supports message filtering also on payload. Previously, it supported it only on attributes, so meta information. Which adds, of course, again to the ambiguity between should I use SNS or EventBridge? Because content-based routing was a feature um, uh, that before only had EventBridge, and now SNS has uh, the filtering on payload too. You could also add um, queues here and um, implement the topic queue chaining pattern. And with that, you add resilience to your overall architecture um, to flatten peak loads, to make sure you don't uh, lose messages when you uh, need some maintenance. All right, let's have a look at another use case, pre-booking campaigns. So White Rides Marketing is also quite busy with running all kinds of campaigns. And what is currently running is um, a campaign with the CTA, a call to action, book your ride for next week, already this week. Um, it doesn't sound too challenging, uh, honestly, so we don't expect too much traffic from it. So the starting um, situation, how we built our architecture in the beginning, is that a wild rights customer uses the app um, to send a request. Uh, here, this is uh, where I want to go next week and, and when particularly. It enters through an uh, API gateway and you have a piece of code, let's call it a pre-booking processing resource, that takes it, stores it in a database and again returns to the client, okay, we have created your booking request, it's all good, all done. Now, marketing, uh, the marketing team says, uh, let's, let's add more campaigns here. And now the call to action is book your ride for next week already today. So not sometime during the week, but today. We would expect a little bit more traffic here. And um, how could we build that? This is a nice example to show how we can also um, decouple um, processing within one service even. So again, we have the managed API gateway, and we now call uh, the c first uh, compute piece here the pre-booking processing, uh, pre-booking pre-processing resource. Because we only do some pre-processing, a sanity check or so, and then hand the request over to the pre-booking forwarding topic, and then return to the client, we have now accepted your request. Uh, we are working on it, and you can uh, check the status in a bit. From a customer perspective, it's only important that even when the traffic is high, um, that I can successfully submit my request. It's okay that the actual processing happens a few seconds later. And in this case, I would add a pre-booking processing queue and then the actual compute that does the processing for the booking. And just to show that there are probably also other services interested in all this, I have added the data lake ingestion service here that ingests everything that comes in into your data lake. Um, obviously, still, we would need to store everything in a database, but there was not is, uh, enough space for the database icon left on this slide. But rest assured, there is a database. Now, the next campaign comes with the CTA book now. So like it's the 8 p.m. news on TV and directly before that news show comes a commercial on TV where it says, book now. I don't know if anyone here uh, watches sequential TV or so, but let's, let's assume there's a nice communication channel where such a CTA can, can be communicated. What we can do now is to put a, a queue before the pre-processing resource to flatten that peak load. If we were to build the uh, client on our own, we could even just talk with the Amazon SQS API here, but typically you don't want to do that, but you would rather still expose a nice uh, API, and therefore we would still have the managed API gateway in front of it. Now I also want to have a look at the data lake ingestion service. And since nobody has called me out for this yet, I'm gonna do it myself. I wouldn't do it like that actually, but uh, I mean, what kind of processing do you expect when you put something in the data lake, you want to store the raw data? 
And here it is an example where it is much more easier and would be my recommendation to use a stream that just offloads everything into the um, data lake raw data tier, which typically would be an Amazon S3 bucket. The next use case I have is called instant write RFQ, request for quotes. Now, not only is Wild Rides a quite peculiar company, also the customers are. And Wild Rides customers don't always want to just get the next available random unicorn from around the corner, but they sometimes want to run requests for quotes with all the unicorns that are in vicinity. Um, and then decide. Maybe the price is the um, decisive criteria or maybe something else like goodies on the right. Like here in Las Vegas, probably it would be a free beer or during the ride or so. So you might remember the scatter gather pattern um, that I have introduced before. This is how it looked like. And we're gonna use that pattern now to implement uh, such an RFQ scenario. What we can also um, see here uh, during the course of uh, when I built up the architecture is how you can still have synchronous uh, communication through REST APIs between client and backend while everything under the hood is asynchronous. So um, the Wild Rides customer would send um, the details um, of the RFQ um, from where to where do I wanna go basically we have an RFQ intake processor who stores it in a database and then subs submits, publishes it um, into the RFQ shared topic. And then it can respond to the client again to, to accept it. We have accepted your RFQ. We are now working on it. We can imagine that the customer can also configure how long such an, how long such an RFQ might uh, take. And let's assume um, we want to have it running for five minutes. So all unicorns have five minutes time to work on their quote and send it back. How does this look like? Uh, let's assume we have a unicorn management service and in there are unicorn management resources that represent each of the unicorns that are in vicinity. And then the apps that uh, are used by the unicorns receive a push notification um, the unicorns can work on their particular quote and it is all being um, sent back into the RFQ response queue where we have an aggregator component um, that does its work and, and stores everything into the database. While this is all going on, what can the client actually do? Well, first thing is it can retrieve a status update. Because in the result, when it um, initially submitted the request, it uh, received back a link to get a status update to, to refresh um, the current status. So we can send a GET request um, to this resource and um, the RFQ result processor would deliver something back. In this case, we see status is still running. Okay. We can retrieve another status update What do we get back? Oh nice, status is done now. And what can the client now do? It can retrieve the result, the link was provided in the previous response, and it gets back um, now the payload with um, all the quotes from the um, unicorns, and it can now select uh, the one that fits best for the customer. Now, um, apparently you think, why should the client always send those requests? Yes, of course. Uh, you would send a push notification to the client once um, the RFQ is over. But you still want to also um, allow the client to retrieve a status update. Uh, so what is the current status? How many responses did you get already? And how does it look like or so? All right, and that was the third and last use case. Uh, I now have a few resources I want to share with you and a call to action. So if you want to um, do some serverless learning, there's a brand new serverless learning badge that you can earn. Uh, just go to that website and you can find uh, all kinds of resources for that. And 
I want to remind you of the Lifehacker's Guide to Software Architecture. If you take one thing away from this talk is item number two, uh, item number one, of course. Um, beware of the faith healer. And a few other resources here. If you want to read some uh, blogs about integration, you can follow those links. Reach out to your friendly solutions architect if you want to um, discuss all this topic. As I said, uh, we have that workshop, Decoupled Microservices. Uh, my colleagues run these with uh, customers too, so you can ask for that if, if you think that will help you and unblock you uh, going forward. And other than that, um, I thank you really a lot for being here tonight. Uh, it's super late. Uh, thanks. I really appreciate uh, that you joined. Feel free to reach out to me via Twitter. Does anyone use Twitter still? I don't know. <laughs> or LinkedIn. Um, happy to uh, discuss your integration challenges with you, but you can, of course, also reach out to your account essay. Thanks a lot, and have a good night. Enjoy your beers. Bye-bye.